Hello, and welcome to today's Connected Classrooms. This is uh, Imagine Science, and we're here with Matthew Putman from Nanotronics Imaging. Um, he's going to talk about some of the cutting edge microscopy they're doing here. Um, we're also joined by two classrooms. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Stewart's class, which is a robotics class for Project Lead the Way. They are in Charleston, Indiana, uh, and the students are from grades 9 through 12. There they all are. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Um, and we also have Ms. Pence's seventh grade class from the science or the science and math classes at the Adelson Educational Campus Middle School in Las Vegas, Nevada. And here they are. Hi, guys. Uh, Hello. Hi. <laughs> I mean, this is this is one of these incredibly surreal moments for me of uh, being this. I'm a few years you guys, uh, so the idea of doing a live Google uh, in class like this is is really amazing to me, and uh, also to have to you know to vicariously pretend I'm in Las Vegas where it's warm, where right here in New York it's so cold. <laughs> uh, but you, as Nate mentioned, you're at Nanotronics Imaging is the name of my company or the, our company. Uh, and we make imaging systems. Now you're actually within a bigger building that does both science and arts, uh, and our companies in other places as well. But I'd like to talk, uh, tell you a little bit about what we do, and I think it should be interesting to those of you that do robotics, because we do a lot of things that involve movement and some artificial intelligence, and we also do things that just involve the exploration of nature on this small scale. And even more than that, what we do is try to figure out how we can enable the next generation of electronics, of uh, biomedicine, uh, of diagnostics for diseases. And all this happens with a combination of using microscopes and even more so using the brain power of our engineers to create software which can see, can, can analyze those things that the microscope is looking at. So thank you so much for joining us today. So you'll see this atmosphere here is a, uh, uh, it's not just me, you will be hearing from uh, Angel Say and Jacob Keith, maybe Paul Rusin. And we do uh, research, you know, at least 10 hours a day out of here. Um, but it's one of those jobs that is, I, I believe, more fun than work for the most part. Uh, we get to see things that nobody has ever seen before because we're looking at them, very small things, over a very large area. And so I'm going to start with... This may be what will seem slightly boring to you, uh, but I find amazing, um, which is what our clients at Nanotronics use, one, one of the things that they use these microscopes for. You don't even call them microscopes, they're whole systems, uh, because they involve robotics and they re involve software. But I don't know if any of you have heard of Moore's Law, um, is that something you're familiar with? No. No? So w one of the founders of, uh, of Intel, who of course is the, makes the processors in most of your computers and the, is the largest semiconductor company, one of the founders uh, many years ago said that every, every two years the size will get exponentially smaller of semiconductors and more transistors will go on them. So by saying this alone, it has allowed the industry of semiconductors to innovate incredibly fast. And for 30 years, we've kept up with that. Uh, and we talk about semiconductors, it's not an industry, it's everything. So it's, it's everything from your cell phones to uh, the way our world is controlled 
then certainly we would not be having this conversation if this idea of Moore's Law had not occurred. Uh, and one thing that's very necessary to make sure that this kind of innovation and exciting future continues is that we're able to image things ever, that are ever smaller. So I'm going to give you one example of this. So we go into these factories and take a microscope and scan over a large area. And in that, we look at these devices that become uh, these microelectronics that are in your computers, your cell phones, and I'm sure your robots. So our, I'd like to get a feel for, do you use microscopes in your schools? If anybody could tell me, or at home, of any kind. You can raise your hand. I mean, if, if somebody would tell me what, I, I mean, I, what is the most exciting thing about using a microscope? Does anybody have any thoughts of why you would like to use microscopes? Please. Uh, so you can see things that you can't see with the naked eye? That's exactly it. That, I, mean, I, I always thought about what the universe looks like before you had a telescope. Um, you didn't know what stars and galaxies were. Um, but there is incredible amounts of life and incredible amounts of detail in universes that uh, exist on this other scale. And what you mentioned about the human eye is also really important to us. So that while the human eye is a really amazing piece of hardware, uh, it's limited. Uh, we can't see very small things. And we think of it limited in another way, is that we get tired, we can't identify what we're seeing all these, the same. So what we provide is a chance to look into this world the way that you would look into space with a telescope, to look into this micro world, and to be able to actually say what, what we're seeing in that world. Please. Come closer. Right there. Um, what? I mean, is it diffi is it difficult to work with these materials? Oh, this is this is a a, a great thing. So the materials that we just looked at, um, semiconductor materials, uh, there it is very difficult, uh, which is sort of the challenge that we have had to face in making these systems. So, other than, if if you were to just take a microscope and manually try to see everything that we're trying to see. So you use focus and you set up different lighting. It would take a lot of time and patience to get it the same every time and to see it. So the big challenge for us is to have a system that controls light so that the lighting is always the same so that we can see the materials in the crispest way possible to make sure that they're in focus all the time and uh, to make sure that we are using the right angle of light and then to make sure that we're using the right camera in order to be able to get an image that we can analyze. So those are just actually a few layers of what we need to do to make sure that we can see these materials. Now this particular material um, is based on silicon uh, as, as what we call a substrate, the main material, silicon being you know, a, a very common, uh, you know, the earth is made of, um, and it's what has been primarily used for microelectronics. But there are some bigger challenges now as we find new types of materials. And some of those challenges are challenges to us when we make microscopes, because some of them are completely transparent. Um, so you can imagine trying to have a microscope focus and be able to see features on something that is nearly invisible. And so, yes, those are a big challenge. Anything else about semiconductors? Please, up in the front. Or anybody, you, you, you guys pick. 
Uh, do you think this is something that should be taught in schools? I, I think that it, it abs so yes on all fronts. Um, so the, there are two things that I'm sort of talking about here. One is what I would call semiconductors and where I would call that even broader, something we call nanotechnology. So that's the study of things that are incredibly small, that are you know, in the billionth of a meter range. And incredible properties occur at that range. In the case of semiconductors, you get this ability to, to have great electrical properties. But it, you also have good optical properties and good physical properties. So should the material science be taught in schools so that we understand, so that everybody understands what happens with nanotechnology and what the potential of nanotechnology is? I think absolutely. Um, this is more, more exciting than any science fiction you can imagine and more practical than, than most science that you could possibly learn, including chemistry and physics and biology, because it actually incorporates physics, chemistry, and biology. Now, teaching about microscopy, microscopes are a tool. So you, can, you don't necessarily need to learn the details of a microscope the way that we need to learn them, but using them as a tool is very important. And this analysis, which is a software uh, programming thing, uh, I think is also very important. To be able to think, to have a logical way of thinking so that when you're looking at something small and looking at something new and trying to create the future, like we're talking about, that you can actually start to implement that change. So computer programming and material science and nanoscience, I think, should be taught in physics, chemistry, and biology classes. And hopefully they, they are being more. Thank you. OK, I'm going to hand this off to our guys for a second so they can show you a few more images. So now we're going to do something a bit interactive for you guys to get an idea of you know, how exactly we're finding all these defects. Uh, so you can see my screen. You can now see what I'm looking at under the microscope, which is uh, right next to me. So this is what this object looks like really magnified. And I'm not going to tell you the object because I want you guys to try to guess what it is. So I'll pan across. And if anybody has a guess as to what it is, I'd love to hear. What do you think? A fly? Or an ant? Part of a fly. Part of a fly. What part of the fly? The legs. The legs? The legs. Awesome. So how did you guys know that this was a fly leg? How did you know? <laughs> was it the shape? Yeah. You could tell with the texture a little bit, they said, and uh, the, the shape. Right. So you look for certain features, right? And you know, your brain has seen something like this several times, and then you know you match up the features. So you see, you know, this long stick-like thing, and then you see hairs coming off of it and joints. And you sort of puzzle that together, and you come to the conclusion that, hey, maybe this is a fly leg. So that's what our job is as you know, software engineers. We are trying to reproduce that same decision-making process so that our computer can say, OK, well, that's a hair. That's part of a leg. That's a joint. That's another leg. This must be a fly leg. We're not doing this with fly legs, so we're doing it with semiconductors. So we look at pieces of the semiconductor, we look at features, and then we say, okay, this is supposed to be this, but there are some problems with it. And then we report those problems to people. So let's look at something else. What do you think we're looking at now? It's a Good. So a wing. Again, how did you know this was a wing? Because we also look at a wing. <laughs> so some of you might be saying, you know, well, I just know. But, you know, there's something happening in your brain that gives you clues and hints as to why this might be 
a win. You know, you've seen something like this before. Uh, you know to look for maybe some sort of transparency or something that looks like a flat, you know, wide object. Um, and this clues you off as to the fact that this is a win. So there's a lot of software being written right now that does just this. And it's more intelligent because, you know, it's able to take in features from the outside world and come to conclusions such as this is a win or, you know, this is a person's face. Now, what is a person's face telling you? They're smiling, they're sad. So this is, you know, part of the work we do is just making more intelligent software. And we do this with images. So you guys want to do one more image? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I will give you a tough one. Yeah, do something harder. OK. Who can tell me what this is? Any guesses? Amoeba. An amoeba? What was that? No, not quite. <laughs> like a feather? A feather? Nope. Mm. Blood? Blood? It's part of an animal. The tongue or the liver was mentioned? Ooh, getting closer with the liver, guess. Heart? Heart? Oh, so not quite. <laughs> Kidney? Right, I'll tell you. It's the small intestine of a dog, or not the whole intestine, but a piece of it. Now, why do you think you weren't able to guess what it was? You haven't seen a dog intestine. Exactly. You've never seen a dog intestine before, so you have no clues in your brain to help you, you know, hone in on the fact that that might be a dog intestine. How often are you looking at dog uh, organs under a microscope? Not too often, right? Um, so this is part of like the cool thing that we're doing is if our tool had seen this for the first time, then it would start to learn, hey, that's what a dog intestine looks like. And the next time we look at an intestine, maybe we'll know what to look for. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. 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 No questions? Yes, we have some questions. Great. We, okay, so we can all get in here, so you can ask any of us. <laughs> Why did you choose to work in the field of nanotechnology? Um, well, for me, uh, I I started to see that uh, I was inspired by a scientist who's named Richard Feynman, and. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Richard Feynman. He passed away in, in the 1980s. Uh, but there, there's some really great books that you will enjoy if you want to learn about physics. But he, and also just learn about sort of a wild lifestyle that he had and that you can be, have a lot of fun being a scientist. So uh, he had spoken in the 1950s about the possibilities of looking at things that was in this nanoscale. And not just for me, but I think now for several generations of people, this has given them and given us a chance to use our imaginations to say that something that is based on real science, something that happens very, very on the very, very small scale, can create huge world impact. And that can mean biosensors, which I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in flexible and stretchable things. Um, I'm, things that have conductivity, um, so that it has electrical properties that are much better than anything we know. Uh, drug delivery systems that can deliver medication uh, without having to do surgery. Uh, all of these things are possible because of nanotechnology. And that inspired me uh, to want to spend my life working in it. Do you need any of, of, of you want to speak about what interests you about nanotech? I don't know. Have you guys have you guys ever played with Legos? Yeah. Everyone loves playing with Legos, right? 
Nanotechnology is kind of like Legos, except the Legos are atoms. So it's, you know, like building cool things that you can just imagine um, with some of the, you know, like world's greatest building blocks. Um, so we're all made up of atoms, and, you know, nanotechnology is kind of taking control of those building blocks, um, which I think is really a cool, pretty cool that we can do that these days. Yeah. Great. Any more questions? Come on up. Yes, we have some more. Come on. Great. Um, when you were a kid, what was your dream job? Like, did you always want to be a scientist? Well, not 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 directly for me. Although I was a huge fan of um, Star Trek when I was a kid, so. I guess I kind of dreamed about the possibility of exploring and doing science, and I I also watched a show called Cosmos, which they have now again, but it was on when I was a kid, and so I, I loved the idea of science. My father was an engineer, and I, I, I loved the idea of science, but I didn't picture it as a career. I pictured it as something fun, like going to the movies, so I didn't. I didn't know, and in fact, my first career, I did not work as a scientist. I studied music, and I played the piano, played jazz music, and I got I produced plays. I did a lot of other things, and then went and got a PhD, got a doctorate, became a scientist. So it's been part of a dream since I was a child, but wasn't always a career choice until more recently. You guys, did you always want to be scientists? I kind of wanted to be a space explorer, <laughs> um, and you know, science has a lot to do. Space relies on a lot of science, so that's sort of what drew me into um, being a scientist and an engineer. The cool thing is that you don't really have to be one thing; you can be a lot of different things. And I know, uh, Angel, you worked in robotics, actually, right? Yeah. So, which is relevant to this group. So, you know, I always knew that I liked building things. I was never exactly sure what I wanted to build. Uh, do I want to build physical objects? Do I want to build software, right, which is not something that you can actually see and grab, but it's just a bunch of code that then appears as interactions. Uh, and, you know, we have things like Facebook, Instagram, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but that's just a bunch of code, and in the end, it's a bunch of ones and zeros. And so I did a lot of robotics in high school. Uh, and it really opened up my eyes as to you know, how we can build the technology of tomorrow. And it really starts by just like being super passionate about something, right? And it mat like it really doesn't matter what it is. Um, it could be you know wanting to go to space, or uh, you know being even just passionate about you know how can we build the technology that I saw on Star Trek. Well, like that's something, right? And that's going to drive you to just learn more and more about the world to try to make that come true. And that's sort of what we're doing here, right? We're building technology, and our technology is going to help people see smaller things. And the smaller things can get, the better technology we can build. Um, so it's, you know, all technology helps everybody, really. Uh, and that's really what, what got me interested in this sort of stuff, is just helping other people, um, whether that's through teaching them, uh, whether that's through writing programs, building actual physical robots, uh, it doesn't matter. Like, I just want to help people and help them have better lives. Come on up. I think we have time for one more question. We have time for one more question is all I guess. I think that okay. I talked too okay. much. Have you created anything using nanotechnology? I, I, I haven't really, but <laughs> yeah, we we've, we've done some pretty interesting things. First of all, everybody creates using nanotechnology, uh, even when we don't know it. Uh, as we know, everything is made up of these building blocks that Jacob spoke of. So we've been using nanotechnology no matter what we build. The difference now is that we can control nanotechnology. So I worked on I worked on building working on some medicine for it wasn't actually medicine it was working on an es, on creating a esophagus so the interior of the throat which used 
of some nanotechnology in order to, with stem cells, to be able to figure out the, the, the a, a way to create something called regenerative medicine. Uh, I worked on uh, a, a design of a new spacesuit that used nanotechnology. And maybe even more relevant, but less cool, um, in one way, I worked on a lot of parts for cars. So I worked with uh, making tires that would last much longer and be more environmentally friendly. Um, I worked on medical devices that were stronger and had better properties. And all of those involved being able to control uh, nanotechnology. Actually, we have one question from the class that didn't have audio. They uh, said, where are you located? And uh, do you work all over the world? Yeah, that is a great thing. Um, we do. So I, the office you're seeing right now, this lab, is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so we're in Brooklyn, New York, but our, our main office, our larger part of our office of our company, Nanotronics, is in Ohio. And we do work all over the, the world. Our clients um, are in everywhere from Taiwan and Korea uh, to uh, a lot in California. And, uh, you know, I, I've worked in, in India. I've worked in Germany, France. Um, Israel and so this takes us all around the world because there are this very fast-growing need to be able to see these things and analyze these things through software that hadn't been done before. And if we have time for one more thing. Oh, one more thing? Um, yes, yes. Did Angel would like to say. Hey guys, so I'm just going to show you one quick cool thing that we've been working on. Um, so this is our microscope right here, right? And the way you typically control it, when I was showing you the, the dog intestine, the fly legs, I was using this joystick, which you can see here. And as I move it, you can see that my screen here is changing, right? I'm moving. Oops. I can move up, down, left, right. And then if something's blurry, I can focus it. But we work with a lot of people who wear really uncomfortable suits or, you know, in the case of these chips, you don't want to be touching them with your hands. So we've been thinking of ways to try to get around that. How can we make this easier to control without using your hands? Are you guys familiar with the Leap Motion? Anybody? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah? Okay. So the Leap Motion is this tiny controller that allows you to interact with your computer using your hands but without touching anything, right? So if I put the leap down here um, and I put my hand above it, I can control the microscope with just the movement of my hand. So do you guys see the image moving around? That's all happening based on where my hand is. So if I move my hand forward, the image moves down. If I go back, I can bring it back. Then I can pan left and right. And so we're developing stuff like this to really just help people uh, you know, do a better job at this. That way they don't have to touch it. And you know, Jacob showed you earlier one of the semiconductor wafers with a fingerprint on the end, right? Well, maybe they could have avoided that if they didn't have to touch it in the first place. Um, so this is just a really cool experiment in seeing how technology like this can enable technology like ours so that we can enable other people to make better technology. So it's a really cool chain. Uh, of just improving everybody's lives. Yeah. That's not, yeah, it's real. <laughs> that is real, yeah. It's not fake. There's nobody behind or inside the computer doing that. And I would ask if you guys want to try it, but, you know, you have to move your hands around. And you're welcome to come visit. Yeah, absolutely. Who would want to go visit? <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> Major field trip. <laughs> it's very cold right now, though, guys. <laughs> not, not, this is not extremely easy. cool. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for joining us. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.